All right, let's start our webinar. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the webinar series of EPSA UNSIL 2022 with the title Exploring Current Trends in English Language Learning. Before we start, I would like to express my gratitude to God who has given us blessings so we can attend this webinar together. I would also thank all of you for joining and participating in this webinar. My name is Angelica Monalisa, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. All right, today we have eight presenters here. I want to say hi to Mulia Rahman. Hello, Mulia. Hello, Teh. Hello, everyone. Okay, next. Hello, Dimas. Hello, Teh. Hello, everyone. Okay. And then, uh, hello, Gelsa. How are you today? Gelsa, are you there? Okay, next we have Frida Yanti Aulia Nur. Hello, Frida. Hello there. Hello, everyone. Okay, next we have Novi Widi Astuti. Hello, Novi. Hello there, hello guys. How's your feeling today? <laughs> I'm kind of nervous. <laughs> okay, calm down, calm down. And next we have Kantia Aprida Salma. Hi, Kantia. Hello there, hello everyone. Okay, and next we have Ningsi Yulianti. Hello, Ningsi. Hello there, hello everyone. Okay, great. And last, we have Siti Fatima Azara. Hello, Zahra. Hello to everyone. Okay, great. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here are some rules for today's webinar. The first one is, this webinar will last for one hour and 30 minutes. The second one, the language that is allowed to use to communicate is only English. The third one, all participants are suggested to take notes during the presentation. The fourth one, all participants must turn off the microphone during the presentation. The fifth one, each presenter will hold the presentation in five until seven minutes. Okay, and the sixth one, the moderator will set the timer to re remind the presenter. And the last, the Q&A session will come after the whole presentation. You can type your question in the chat box, or if you're interested in talking directly, please react in raise hand, and we will facilitate you if we still have time. And then if you could not get your answer, the presenters will send the answer via email. All right. Uh, without any further ado, now it's time to listen to our first presenter with the topic, uh, where does our identity come from? Let's discover it. Okay, Mulia, the time is yours. All right, um, is my screen visible? Yes. Okay. Thank you to Mudirato for the time. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to this webinar series. Such an honor to be here with you. I am Mulia Rahman from Siliwangi University. And today, I'm going to talk about identity with the presentation entitled, Where Does Our Identity Come From? Let's discover it. I divided my presentation into three main topics. Those are, what is identity? Concepts of identity and how do we get our identity? So guys, without any further ado, let's go to the first topic. What is identity? 
According to Jenkins in 2000, identity refers to the ways in which individuals and collectivists are distinguished in their social relation with other individuals and collectivists. In the other word, identity is refers to self-portrait which consists of religious identity, political identity, career identity, intellectual identity, culture, personality, and interest. Kudikuns and Modi in 2002 states that identity is important in a cultural communication. Why? Because it makes someone distinguished from other people, so it is easier to recognize. Okay, let's move to the next topic, concept of identity. In the social identity theory, according to Tezbel and Turner in Budikun's 2002, individuals have concepts in socializing and identifying themselves. Those are personal identity and social identity. Personal identity describes that human is unique being, has a culture, and lives in a group. And social identity is reverse to the way of communicating with other cultures. Then, how do we get our identity? Our identity is shaped by many aspects. First is personal interest. It is how the things we like become our identity. For example, someone is like photography and acting. So the identity of that guy is the identity of an, as an artist. And then self-contractuals. It is how individuals express themselves when communicating with other individuals. And then culture. Culture influences our identity our shape. Because this gives label for the group that you belong. Within culture, you will find language, your beliefs, and how to interact with other people. And then family. We get our identity from generation to generation. For example, Jake's father's name is Anderson. So the identity of Jake is son of Anderson. And the next aspect is society. We get an identity from our role in society. For example, one day Lara is the student of the school. And then a few years later, Lara becomes the teacher of that school. So the identity can change according to what we do. And then friends. Friends that we choose can influence the way our identity are shaped. It is all up to you whether you whether you wave, whether you ride with the wave or you just yourself. And the last is social media. Our profile and post in social media can influence our identity. Okay, uh, we move to the conclusion. The formation of an inner identity in a person is the result of an individual in social interaction with other individuals in a group. We get our identity according to what we choose to do. Well, guys, before I close this presentation, I would like to share you a quote that you better remember. Life isn't about finding yourself. Life is about creating yourself. George Bernard Shaw. All right, thanks for your attention. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Back to the moderator. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, Mulya. That was a great opening presentation. All right, after listening to Mulya's presentation, I hope we won't feel confused again about identity and where it comes from again. Okay, now I want to invite our second presenter, Dimas Subarka, with his topic, music as an EFL learner's activity in listening. Okay, Dimas, seven minutes from now. All right, uh, so first, thank you to the moderator for giving me the time to do the presentation. 
Uh, good morning to honorable lecturers, friends, and the audience of Academic Presentation Webinars 2022. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Dimas Umbarka, and in this opportunity, I would like to cover a topic entitled Music as EFL Learner's Activity in Listening. And I will divide this presentation into three uh, sections. The first one is about listening. The second one is about the reason music as listening activity. And the last one is about the activity itself. So without any further ado, let's get straight to the presentation. Next slide, please. All right, so talking about uh, listening, did you know that 85% of what we have learned is from listening? How come? It is because in our daily life, we spend a lot of time listening to various information, such as from people's conversation, television, video, and even music. Next slide, please. And I believe that we have already familiar with the word listening. However, in here, I'm going to show you the definition of listening. So according to David Newton in 2003, listening is an active, purposeful process of making sense of what we hear. And listening also become the most important language skill. Brown in 2001 state that listening is the major component in language learning and teaching, because in the classroom, learners do more listening than speaking. And a part of become the most important language skill, listening also considered as the most difficult skill to learn. According to research, listening skills have their own difficulties compared to learning other language skills, such as speaking, reading, and writing. And one of the difficulties in, lear in learning listening skill is that the learner are susceptible to feel bored and not interesting in learning process. And how do we deal with this problem? Next slide, please. And yeah, the answer is by the music. And why music? Because listening music is enjoyable activity. And according to survey, average people spend about 18.4 hours per week listening to the music, show that people's interest in the listening, listening music is very high. And regardless, music is enjoyable activity. Here are three positive effects if we apply music as listening activity in the classroom. So the first one is music creates safe and natural eaters natural classroom eaters. Uh, Sari Coban in 2000 claimed in class environment, amused students can make them feel enjoyed and get rid of the uncomfortable atmosphere while learning lingual structure program music. In addition, this positive atmosphere and relaxing mood broke by music make it easier to resolve the problem in the classroom. And the next is music provide opportunities for repetition and practice. Repetition of the language is a pleasurable, such as repeating chorus or singing cumulative music uh, when the, the verse, each verse borrow words from the previous verse. And according to Romley in 1999, this repetition in music must often accompany by cycle action. So it helped to learn and turn uh, the familiarity so that the learners feel comfortable with the foreign language. And the last one is music provide opportunity for the real language. So according to Sharp in 2001, song or music provide an occasion for real language used in a fun and enjoyable situation. Uh, she also claimed that music is a vital part in our life, inside and outside the school, any incorporating the foreign language into this fundamental activity is another way to no normalizing it. Next slide, please. All right, so next we move to the example of activity and music as listening activity. So the first one is choose. So choose an English song. It could be any type or any uh, genre you prefer. And the next is listen and comprehend the music you have choose. And next, try to guess the lyric without see the lyric of the music. And then after that, you compare what you have guessed with uh, by C, the lyric. And then the last one is repeat it again and over again. Next slide, please. All right, so the next one, we move to the conclusion of this presentation. So listening is an activity to find meaning from something that is heard. 
Listening skill is the most important skill in learning language, including English. However, EFL learners are susceptible to feel bored and not interested during the learning process. Music and song as fun activity has potential to be applied and to improve English listening activity in the classroom. All right, so here are the, refer the references I use for this uh, presentation. And unfortunately, we have arrived in the end of the presentation. But before I close the presentation, I have a quote for, from Jared Spark. Jared Spark. He said that when you talk, you repeat what you already know. And when you listen, you often learn something. All right, thank you so much, everyone. My name is Dimas Subarka. And Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Back to the moderator. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dimas. It was so knowledgeable, and maybe most of us are relate to Dimas' presentation because music is a fun medium to learn about listening. And yeah, we're not going to be boring since we are free to choose uh, what kind of music and genres we like. Okay, next, uh, we have our third presenter, Gelsa Santana with her topic, Building Colorful Vocabulary by Reading the Novel. Okay, Gelsa, the time is yours. All right. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to the moderator for giving me the time to speak. And thanks also to all my friends who have uh, attended this event. And don't forget to thank God for giving us the opportunity to be able to attend this event in good health. So first of all, let me introduce myself first. My name is Gelsa Nurazmi Santana, but most people usually call me Gelsa. And I'm a student at Siliwangi University. In this occasion, I would like to bring the topic about vocabulary learning. Building colorful vocabulary by reading novel. Judging from the text, uh, judging from the title, what I brought, this refer a discussion about tips and tricks, right? So uh, next slide, please. Here I have five topics. The first topic is about what is vocabulary. The second is the difficulties in learning vocabulary. And the third one is how to solve it by reading novel. And the fourth is the miracle reach of vocabulary. And the last is conclusion. So to split the time, let's get started with the first discussion about what is vocabulary. Vocabulary is all about words, word in a language, or a collection of words that are learned. Yeah, vocabulary is an important part of learning, especially for us as an English education learners. If we don't know the meaning of the words, of course, we will have the difficulty in understanding what we see, what we read, what we hear, and what we learn. And then vocabulary has an important role in determining the successful achievement of each skill. Yeah, um, vocabulary is also important for daily communication. The more vocabulary we have, the more easily we will communicate and express what we want to say. And listening, speaking, reading, and writing are all language skills that use vocabulary in our activities, right? So according to Hatch and Borland in 1995, vocabulary is a list or set of words for a particular language or a list or set of words that individual speaker of language might use. Um, move to the, next, to the next topic. Next slide, please. Um, the difficulties in learning vocabulary or someone's problem in learning vocabulary. The first one is foreign language learners are easily forgetting the vocabulary they already know. Yeah, that's all my experience. Um, the main factor that hinders easy to forgetting to memorize uh, vocabulary is lack of practice and lack of self-seriousness. And then length and complexity. Um, long words seems to be no more difficult to learn than short ones, but as a rule of thumb, um, high frequency words seems to be no more a uh, word tend to be short in English. And Therefore, the learners is likely to meet them more often. And then, uh, in addition, variable stress in polysyllabic words, such as in word families like necessity, necessary, and necessarily, um, can add to their difficulties. 
And the last is have trouble in pronouncing words, how to write and, um, and spelling. Um, one of the causes of someone's difficulties in learning vocabulary was the several grammatical type of words called inflection. Um, next slide, please. And then how to solve it by reading novel. Choose a novel based on your interest. Yeah, the first thing what uh, should we do is choose a novel according to our interest. Then read it as usual. Then if find a foreign word, give a highlight. Um, if we find a foreign word or we don't know the meaning, we can give a circle or highlight using a pen or star or or colorful star below, and then look for the meaning on the on the dictionary and write uh, write um, and write it near the word. And then memorize them and write them. Yeah, from the word we wrote earlier, memorize them and write them in our notebooks at least um, three until five words a day. And then have a target reading time. Um, have a target reading time on a regular basis. For example. 20 minutes each reading a day. And then the last one is make it a habit. So next slide, please. The fourth topic is the miracle reach of vocabulary or um, the benefits if, we've, if we have more vocabularies. The first one is high heart rates across the board. In order to succeed in these classes, you will need to be proficient at written communication, which includes using uh, college vocabulary words appropriately and fluently, and then better job prospect. According to a 2010 survey of employers conducted by the Association of the American Colleges and University, 89% um, of respondents said post-secondary uh, institutions should better prepare uh, graduates in terms of written and oral communication skills. And then the last one is career advancement opportunities. Um, if you are able to leverage your college vocabulary to earn a managerial position, then you can expect to start reaping some monetary rewards. Um, next slide, please. So the last one is a uh, conclusion. The conclusion is vocabulary is the most important skill when learning. By reading the novel, your vocabulary will expand as you read. The more words you read, the more words you will be, to, will be able to learn. A flourishing mental dictionary is created by continuously learning new words, viewing their context, and exposing yourself to their usage. Um, so this is just a way to increase our vocabulary. Um, of course, there are many other ways to increase vocabulary. The main factor, uh, the most important, I mean, uh, is to do it and don't forget to practice because practice makes perfect. So I think that's enough from me. Thank you for your nice attention. And I'm sorry if I make mistakes. I give it back to the moderator. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wow, that was a very comprehensive explanation. Thank you so much, Gelsa. <laughs> Talking about novels, if we often read novels, we can see that each uh, author has their writing style. Therefore, we will uh, find a lot of new vocabulary that we can learn as well as various types of idioms. And then start reading uh, your novels from now because you can learn a lot of <clears throat> new vocabulary there. All right, before we continue to the next presenter, I want to remind all of you that if you have already uh, questions, for Mulia, Dimas, and Gelsa, you can type them now in the chat box. Thank you. Okay, let's continue to our fourth presenter. We have Frida Yanti Aulianur with the topic, Memorizing Vocabulary Skills Through Association Strategy. Okay, Frida, seven minutes from now. All right, thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello, good morning, everyone. 
Welcome to the webinar. Thank you to the moderator for hosting the meeting and has given me the time. And also, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining this webinar. Let me introduce myself. My name is Vidente Elianor, and nice to meet you. On this occasion, I would like to convey a topic with the title Memorizing Vocabulary Skills Through Association Strategy. Next slide, please. All right, first, first of all, I want to ask you guys, have you ever experienced forgetting some words that you know, but you just forget? Because I have experienced it. And if you guys also have experienced this kind of problem, don't worry, let's solve it by understanding the source problem and how to solve it. Next slide, please. Okay, guys. Uh, the... The slide before, the second slide. All right. Can you see the picture here? Yes, one of the obstacles that influence the progress of vocabulary is that forgetting the vocabulary. Do you agree that the more we memorize it, the harder it is to stick in our minds? As Steve Kaufman states that the best way to memorize vocabulary is not just to memorize vocabulary. The fact that we force ourselves to memorize the word like no matter how hard uh, you try, some words will stick and some will not stick until much, much later. And how to get better at memorizing words. Next slide, please. Let's see the slide here. I took the strategy from Oxford 1990. It talks how the association work, like the relation or the connection between word form and meaning that is really important in memorizing vocabulary. And I took two association strategies as the most effective strategies for learners. The first association is with pictures and the second is with context or topic. So let's start with association with the picture. Next slide, please. Arias agreed that association with pictures is highly useful for those learners who are visually oriented. You must already know how highly effective the image keyword is to recall word since the strong effect that pictures have on our memory. Let's see the example of classroom activity using association with picture. Here it is. As you can see here, the teacher gives the students the picture and the word that students will memorize. With looking what and how it looks like, students can easily remember and also differentiate between these vocabularies because they see the word and the picture of the vocabulary at the same time. Teacher can give, can give them a quick question like, what is this? What is this? By showing the picture and students will answer it. If they can answer the question quickly, it means that they can memorize it, especially if they can memorize the word with just uh, looking at the picture. And you guys can also learn it by yourself because you know these days so many people use technology. We can search it on Google and we try to memorize the vocabulary until it can be memorized by ourselves. So it's really helpful to connect the words with the pictures for our memorizing skills. Let's move to the second strategy. We have association with context or topic. Turnberry stated that the topic can be used by students to build up an association network. It means that the strategy connects the vocabularies with a particular context or topic. Okay, so I will give an example in the classroom activity. The first, uh, the teacher can give a topic to the students. After giving the, to the topic to the students, students have to search for some words that are related to the topic that has been given by the teacher. For example, here we have a teacher gives the student the short story about holiday in the beach, and then they will be looking for the words that can build the story. Here I took an example from, for some words related to the story about holiday in the beach. We have some words like swimsuit, beach, sun, backpack, sand castle, etc. After that, let them memorize the word and understand the meaning. This strategy is very useful for long-term memory. Like if in the future, they are asked about the vocabulary about a particular topic, they can remember it quickly. Like, oh yeah, I remember these words, swimsuit, beach, sand castle. It reminds me of holiday in the beach, something like that. So it proves that students can memorize the words if teacher connects memorizing vocabulary learning to a particular topic. Next slide, please. All right, guys, in conclusion, based on the stud uh, studies cited above, it can be concluded that association is one of the most useful strategies for memorizing vocabulary. And sadly, I wouldn't recommend memorizing analysis of vocabulary on this word like this, because you know it's not effective and spend too much time. 
and I recommend you to start with association strategy. So don't give up and keep patient, keep use the words that you want to remember and use it as often as possible. So the more you use the words, the more completely you will understand and remember them. Because as Leo Tolstoy said, the strongest of all warriors are these two, time and patience. All right, next slide, please. Last but not least, here are the references for my presentation and I would like to thank you for your attention. Hopefully my presentation could be helpful for you all. Thank you and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. All right, thank you so much for your great presentation, Fida. So association strategy sounds new for me and maybe everyone here. Still, the important point of uh, Frida's presentation is that association is a very powerful memory strategy that allows the brain to connect something uh, it's already familiar with to something that it's not familiar with. So the brain can easily learn and remember the unfamiliar one by connecting the unfamiliar to the familiar one. That's right. Okay. Let's move to our fifth presenter. We have Noki with the STT. She will talk about typing tweets as a, as a helper in activating EFL students' passive vocabulary. All right, Noki, the time is yours. All right. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello, everyone. First of all, I would like to say thank you to moderator for giving me opportunity to present my topic on this webinar. And I also thank all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining this webinar. It's an honor for me to become one of the speakers here. All right. Let me introduce myself. My name is Nafili Astuti, and now I would like to present to you all about my topic, that is typing tweets as a helper in activating EFL students' passive vocabulary. In this presentation, I will focus on three aspects. The first is the differences between passive and active vocabulary. The second is the importance of active vocabulary. And the last one is ways to activate passive vocabulary through typing tweets. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide, yeah. Okay, have you ever read something in English and then you found a word that you understand but somehow you never used that word? Okay, you can respond to me on the chat box. Yes or no? Okay, thank you for your responses. And it's nothing wrong with you because in fact, from the total vocabulary that you have understood, only a part that you can use uh, confidently in speaking or writing. Okay, let's begin by taking a look at the differences between passive and active vocabulary. According to Smith, 2008, Passive vocabulary refers to words that we can understand when they appear in speech or writing, but are not yet able to use. Meanwhile, active vocabulary consists of the words you understand and use confidently in speaking or writing. Generally, the differences between passive and active vocabulary lies in how much our familiarity with the word. In the case of passive vocabulary, we might recognize and understand a word, but we are not fully familiar with it. Meanwhile, in the active vocabulary case, we know the precise meaning of the word and how to use that word in the right context. Hasa 2021. And for the next difference, in any language, passive vocabulary is much larger than active vocabulary. And it's normal. According to Hasa 2021, this is true both for language learners and even for native speakers because in line with Kaufman 2009, the ratio to convert passive word into active word is just about 10 by one. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide. Right. After knowing the differences between them, let's move on to the importance of active vocabulary. But in 2015, we feel that to give proficiency in the spoken and written language, word must continuously be added to the active vocabulary. But claim that active vocabulary is important and required. The first is for the use of the right word in the right place. The right place here means context, of course, and the second is for the spontaneous recall of word. And the next is for grammatical accuracy. For example, the use of correct tenses and word order. And last but not least, 
for fluency and ability in speech to reproduce correct pronunciation, intonation, rhythm, etc. Okay, next slide. All right. Finally, guys, we arrive at the main part of our discussion, which is about activating passive vocabulary through typing twists. Well, first, we should remember that active vocabulary comes from passive vocabulary that is activated. And the question is how to increase our active vocabulary. In according to the British Council, basically, the only way to activate passive vocabulary is to use them continuously in writing or speaking until finally it's fully activated. But on this occasion, we will only discuss writing or typing as an attempt to activate word. Well, so typing tweet or writing status on Twitter can be beneficial for increasing your active word because in line with Scott and Vivia 2010, writing is promising vehicle for vocabulary development. In addition, Mahmudah in 2014 stated that uh, in writing, people use vocabulary to develop their idea, so they should choose the word accurately for a particular context. Okay, and now I will share with you the ways we can do to activate our passive vocabulary through typing, through typing tweets. The first step, decide which word we want to be activated from your passive vocabulary. According to Kaufman 2009, Passive vocabulary can be obtained through listening and reading in different contexts since it's the only source of new words. And then the second step, look up its meaning and context by looking at digital dictionary because as we know, nowadays the digital dictionary is the most qualified dictionary, right? And then the next step, typing a tweet on Twitter by using that word. In this case, typing tweet is the opportunity for you to use that word. And then the last step, on other occasion, use the word again and again until finally you master the word. Because in line with Nation 2020, to learn a word, we need several repetitions. All right, next slide, please. All right, all right, it is everything I want to convey. And now let me summarize the main point of my talk. So, Active vocabulary is important for you to produce a language, and the only way to activate your vocabulary is by using them in speaking or writing. Therefore, one of the strategies is by typing tweets on Twitter by using passive word until it's activated completely. And here I also have a quote for you guys which might be your motivation to increase your active vocabulary. A lot of hard work is hidden behind nice things. Okay, next slide. And these are all my references. Okay, it seems enough from me. Thank you for uh, your great participation in this presentation. I hope this material is beneficial for us. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm Novi, back to the moderator. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wow, that's a very great explanation. Thank you so much, Novi. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we can learn English for something uh, that we use every day. Like Novi said, typing tweets can help us activate our passive vocabulary. So stop tweeting something bad and start expressing yourself with words that you did not regularly use in the past. Well, after discussing various strategies to gain an improved vocabulary, uh, now we will talk about self-talk practice for English, speaking fluency by Kantia Aprida Salva. All right, Kantia, the time is yours. All right, thank you, moderator. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone. First of all, thank you, moderator, for handing this webinar session. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending this webinar. It's an honor for me here. I'll introduce myself first. I'm Kantia Prida Salma, one of the students at Silver University. And my topic here is about self-talk practice for English speaking fluency. I divided my presentation into section here. The first is about self-talk overview. Uh, the second is about self-talk superiorities. And then the third is simple form of self-talk practice. 
As we know that the ability to speak English is crucial in order to be able to communicate properly. Also uh, the fluency, which is the flow and efficiency um, to express our ideas when speaking, especially the position of English uh, as international language, right? And uh, one practice that is considered effective, that is considered potential for us uh, to increase our speaking fluency is self-talk. What is self-talk? Do you guys know what is self-talk I mean? So uh, let's begin with an overview of self-talk first. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. All right, thank you. Uh, according to AB 2021, according to AB 2020, I mean, uh, one of the teams from Marcel Lingua, which is a language learning application company on their YouTube channel, said that self-talk or self-conversation is talking to ourselves in our target language so that we will continue to do it loudly. Then this definition is supported by Pro Ben Si Hong in 2017, a uh, claim that the self-talk practice requires learners to speak for themselves individually uh, from what they want to talk or think about. So in this case, it can be said that uh, we practice speaking with ourselves individually using English uh, as the target language for learners and actually we are able to practice speaking uh, from what we think from uh, what we want to talk or even also uh, from uh, what we want to practice and in fact here either or willfully or just for fun when learners practice it it is considered capable of being an activity that can help learners uh, to gain uh, fluency and even correct pronunciation so uh, it is effective uh, but why it is effective for uh, our english speaking fluency uh, that point will be explained uh, in the next slide, which is about self-talk superiorities. All right, here we go. In this case, Lewis 2021 mentioned that there are five superiorities self-talk has potential for uh, English speaking fluency. The first here is convenient to do. Uh, this means that we'll feel comfortable uh, because the self-talk is individually and uh, we can do it wherever and whenever we want. And the second, because self-talk is flexible. When we do self-talk, we do it flexibly from what we think, from uh, what we want to talk about, even we can do this as a form of practice when we are facing an event or such a competition. So we can keep doing it. And then the third is free. Surely we do this self-talk practice uh, free because we practice independently without the help of others. So we don't need any budget here, right? And then uh, the, far, the fourth is no shy. Of course, uh, we can do it without feeling ashamed. We only practice alone without seeing it, without seeing uh, the crowd or other people around us. And then the last priority is uh, uh, no fear. Uh, we'll, uh, what is it? Uh, we do stop talk without feeling uh, no, no afraid here because uh, when do you stop talk, we only talk to ourselves and in front of ourselves. So far, how do you do that? Uh, does it really have potential for us? Next slide, please. All right, uh, here we'll be discussed in more detail, which is about self-talk, a simple form of self-talk practice that is learners can do to become fluent in speaking English. As you can see in the illustration here, one example of self-talk practice is talking in front of a mirror. Uh, this sounds familiar, right? Uh, when we go to practice, we can do a monologue a few minutes in front of a mirror. Then we can see to our word, we can uh, pay attention to our expression, our gesture or body language until we improvise uh, our self-talk in front of a mirror. Because the more we practice and improvise our self-talk, automatically our fluency will be improved, uh, our fluency will be trained. And this activity proven in the result of research conducted by Anjani 2018 found that self-talk in form of speaking in front of mirror is considered to be able to increase a learner's fluency in speaking English. So in this case, we can continue to practice um, speaking to make sure and to hone our own level of fluency. And in addition, we are also able to practice this self-talk to prepare for an event or such a competition as Haryan in Hazard in 2017 revealed that self-talk practices can also be used by learners to prepare themselves in several uh, ways such as uh, public speaking, speeches, or presentation. Obviously, in this case, self-talk practice is also influential on self-preparation, especially in increasing our fluency when dealing with it, because we see it a simple practice but has a lot of potential for us, especially for learners. All right, next slide, please. Okay, everyone, we are nearing at the end of my presentation here. So we can conclude that self-talk is one of the speaking practices that can be done by learners to practice their fluency and two easy and potential activities then uh, they will gradually increase their English speaking fluency. 
And here I have a great quote from multilingual expert uh, Steph Kaufman in his video saying that once you got to speak, just let go. And next slide. And yeah, that's all I can say, everyone. And these are some of the references that I used to support my presentation here. Thank you for your great attention, ladies and gentlemen. I hope my presentation is useful for all of you here. Thank you. I'll be back to moderator. All right, that was a very nice presentation. Thank you, Kantia. All right, doing self-talk is actually so fun. Uh, don't be afraid because it's free and all you need is only yourself so that no one will judge you. <laughs> to everyone who often feels an anxious about learning uh, English speaking, you can follow what's on Kantia's explanation. That's really helpful. Okay, next we would still talk about speaking, but now with the title Reducing EFL Student Speaking Anxiety Using Cognitive Strategies by Ningsi Yulianti. Okay, Ningsi, you can start it right now. Thank you, moderator, for hosting this webinar and giving me the time to carry out my presentation. Hello, everyone. First of all, the distinguished ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending this session. My name is Nixie Julianti, and the topic of my presentation today is reducing EFL students speaking anxiety using cognitive strategies. Um, in this presentation, I will divide it into three major parts, which are the background information about speaking anxiety, cognitive strategies and the benefits of cognitive strategies. But everyone, before we're going to the first part of my presentation, uh, I want to know what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word speaking? Come on, you can respond in the chat box. Okay, scary, nervous, the kind of feelings are normal for everyone, especially if English is not your first language. You need to know that this kind of feelings are the symptoms of speaking anxiety. Okay, let's find out more about speaking anxiety. Here I put a picture that I got from healthline.com, which shows how anxiety in this context, speaking anxiety looks like. It looks like an explosion coming from your brain, affecting your thoughts to be spiral and out of control. Related to this, Siplakides in 2019 pointed out that speaking anxiety makes students reluctant to participate actively in speaking due to the lack of motivation and low performance, especially for EFL students as young in 1990 emphasized that they always cite speaking as their most anxiety producing experience. Because of those negative impacts that it has, speaking anxiety undoubtedly needs to be reduced so that the success of teaching and learning process in terms of speaking can be reached. And one of the ways in reducing speaking anxiety is by using cognitive strategies. So what are cognitive strategies, everyone? Do you know what cognitive strategies are? As you can see here on my screen, cognitive strategies are basically one of the four main categories of self-regulated strategies which have been introduced by many researchers and theoreticians. This is supported by Majub and Majub in 2015 that students should be trained to use specific strategies to be able to self-regulate their speaking so that they can learn speaking in more enjoyable manner. Talking about cognitive strategies, it is categorized into four strategies by Elsaka in 2016. Let's talk about rehearsal or repetition strategy first. Um, in this strategy, the students repeat the material over and over again to save the information in their memory. For example, the students are going to do a presentation in the next meeting. So they do a rehearsal for several times so that the output, their presentation will be great. And the next is elaboration strategy. It helps the students in generating connection and see the relationship between new material and material that is already known by the students. So it makes the students understand the material better because they have broadened the scope of their knowledge by linking it to the knowledge that they already gain. Next, we have all our organizational strategy. It helps the students in saving information in order to be processed and saved more efficiently. So the, the students in here in this strategy have to organize all the material, all the knowledge that they already gain. For example, they do a note taking in order to organize all the materials like this note taking is about persuasive speech. This note taking is about informative speech and so on and so forth. And finally, the last one we have here is problem solving strategy. It helps the students 
to break down a problem into smaller bits so that they can visualize the material to facilitate learning. Um, if we relate it to speaking, the students will always have problems when they have to speak in front of the classroom, right? So in this strategy, the students are required to analyze the problems they may arise as well as its solution so they can find a solution for that problem. And the teacher's role here is very important as the teachers can give the best solution for the students. So with all of that, everyone, we can understand that cognitive strategies are actually mental routines and procedures, just like studying for a test or solving a problems and etc. And it is clear that cognitive strategies are beneficial in reducing EFL students speaking anxiety, as it is supported by, Maj by Alang in 2017, that students are becoming more active and confident in speaking with the application of cognitive strategies, because cognitive strategies makes the students understand and master the material better. For example, they're going to do a speech. So they apply these cognitive strategies. They rehearse for several times. They elaborate and organize the material they're going to say in their speech. And they also solve the problems they have related to speaking in front of a lot of people. All right, everyone, unfortunately, we've come to the end of my presentation. So far, I have delivered about speaking anxiety, cognitive strategies, and the benefits of cognitive strategies. My suggestion here is that the teachers can give self-regulated instructions and always supervise the students in the process of applying these cognitive strategies. Last but not least, I want to close my presentation with an incredible quote from George Chessel. The human brain starts working the moment you are born and never stops until you stand up to speak in public. That's all from me. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I hope my presentation will be beneficial for every one of us here. I give it back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. There was an excellent presentation. Um, all right, from what explained by Nancy, let's say bye to speaking anxiety because uh, we have the cognitive strategies to fix it. And uh, if you are a teacher in the future, you can apply it uh, to your class, even to yourself whenever you feel anxious to speak. Uh, all right, now we have our last presenter, Siti Fatima Azara. Hello, Zara. How's your feeling about being the last presenter? All right, thank you to moderator for giving me the time. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The honorable old lecturers of English Education Department at Siliwangi University and all the participants, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Siti Fatima Azahra and I'm a part of English Education Department. And today I will explain to you a topic Related to intercultural communication, the title is Inculcating the Courage of Millennials Intercultural Communication Through Social Media. Okay, next slide, please. All right, uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, everyone, this is our day table of content. First one is introduction. I will explain to you what is intercultural communication in a nutshell. Uh, the second slide, please. <laughs> the previous slide. And no. The second slide next you the okay, the previous one. Before okay. Thank you. The first one, introduction. No, <laughs> the slide. Okay. Uh, the first one is introduction. I will explain to you what is intercultural communication in Agile. And then the second one is uh, about how, about the role of social media for millennials. And then the third one is main topic. Our today's main topic. It is about how social media can inculcate the courage of, of intercultural communication. And then the last one is references. Okay, next slide, please.
Introduction, intercultural communication. What is intercultural communication? According to stated, according to stated for Dr. Steve Klein, intercultural communication is communication between people with different identities. And identities itself, according to Mulia's presentation before, it is include about a religion, region, nation, culture, and others. So when you talk with someone who has a different culture with you, it is intercultural communication. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, intercultural communication. Intercultural communication is very likely to happen for everyone, including millennials. Related to Pransky, millennials are hailed as digital natives. Millennials are easier to use social media because social media itself has an important role for millennials. For millennials itself, social media is a place for express opinion, place to be creative and found an international friends. So how social media can inculcate the courage of millennials intercultural communication? Next slide, please. Okay, as we know, social media is a place for sharing opinion. So how social media can inculcate the courage of millennial intercultural communication? The first one is reduce nervousness. So in 2011, the social media assisted in students to overcome cultural barriers because sometimes you often feel afraid to get acquainted with new people, especially that person has different cultural backgrounds. However, along with development of technology, social media help us to get rid of that fear. Introduction between people in a way can reduce the awkwardness that usually occurs when we talk with someone in real life. And then you know that uh, when we talk with someone in real life, it's very awkward, but in social media, it is more uh, the user more comfortable in interacting with each other because the excessive nervousness that usually arises when interacting with new friends can be more controlled. And then the second one is to the right diction. According to the measurement, uh, according to the measurement, diction has an important role because it is play the role for constructing public impression. Because we know that uh, social, in social media, we can we have a time to think a lot to choose right diction. Now. The, uh, in frequently uh, we meet with new friends we, we meet with new friends we uh we speak this the polite diction for them in their culture greet them in this diction so in social media we can we have like we have a lot of we have we have a lot of time to choose the right diction and then the last one is easy to get an international friends with the same interest. Based on the study conducted by students majoring in science at the University of Rio, it was stated that social media helped them find international friends with the mutual interest. We know that in social media, it is very useful for us to uh, visit their Instagram account or other social media account. And from that, we know all about them. We know about her lifestyle, we know about her hobby, and all of them. And according to their feed, according to their Instagram account, we can make a conversation because we want, uh, we want to, uh, because we know one topic we, we, we won't talk about. Okay, the next slide, please. So this is our this is my references I used to my presentation. So we can conclude that social media is very useful for us for uh, inculcate the courage of millennial intercultural communication because in social media we can we have more time to think at best diction and then we can reduce our nervousness, our awkwardness, and we can uh, use social media in the good way in interacting each other, even though in different cultures. So thank you very much. I think enough of me. And I hope this presentation is useful for, for us. For, thank you for attention. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I give it back to moderator.
All right, thank you, Zara, for delivering a great final presentation. Intercultural communication is always an important and interesting topic to talk about. Okay, since all presenters have already presented their topics, let's move on to the Q&A session. If you have a question, you can type it on the chat box or you can hit the raise hand feature if you want to ask our presenters directly. Okay, I think we have, we already have several questions. The first one is from Putri Hanindia Tama. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Let me introduce myself. My, I am Putri Hanindia Tama from EXA 2020. I would like to ask a question for Fida Yanti Aulia. Can you give a clear explanation why memorizing vocabulary by word list method is not effective? Thank you. Okay, Frida, maybe you want to answer this question? All right. Uh, okay, so uh, I want to try answer Putri Hanin's question. Thank you for the good question, Putri Hanin. So the question is, can you give a clear explanation why memorizing vocabulary by word uh, list method is not effective? To be clear, we certainly want to remember vocabulary for a long period of time, right? You know that by just memorizing vocabulary from a list words, it will not last long, like one or two days, we will forget it. If we cannot associate vocabulary with other things, it's hard to get our memorization back. And that's the point of strategic association, because if at any time we forget a vocabulary, at least you can connect that vocabulary with a certain like picture or topic. In contrast to just memorizing a list of words, it's very difficult to recall what has been memorized. So it can be concluded, memorizing a list of words is not really effective, especially for learners. Thank you. All right, thank you, Frida. Okay, Putri, how about it? Is it clear enough? Okay, I hope that Frida's answer is clear enough, yeah? Okay, next uh, we have a question from Sheila. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sheila from University, Siliwang University. Well, such an interesting topic to discuss today. You guys did a great job, but I kind of wanted to know further about something. So this question addressed to Gelsa. Well, I'm really curious about your point of view about using novels to expand students' vocabularies. So why novels? Since we are focusing in the context of EAP or English for Academic Purposes. Why don't we use any academic writing? What makes novels is so special in increasing our vocabulary? Thank you. All right, Gelsa. You want to answer this question? Um, all right, permission to answer the question from Sheila. Um, why I prefer novels to be used as material to expand our vocabulary? Because I think that novels are more interesting by learners and not wanting to read. And even though academic academic writing has many benefits, but for learning vocabulary, I think using novel is also an interesting way to improve our vocabulary. That's all. All right, Sheila, is it clear? Okay, I hope it's clear. And next, uh, we have a question from Raihani. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Raihani Fitri Salsabila from AED 2020. I'm interested in Gelsa's topic. So I would like to ask her a question. Do you have any suggestions for novels with easy to understand vocabulary for beginners or someone who is just starting to get interested in reading novels? Thank you. Um, all right, um, I have suggestion to read novel 
with the title is My Place by Sally Morgan in 90, 90, 1987. Um, in this novel, tells about the ident identity crisis experienced by Aboriginal mixed blood in the environment, and then exploring the dark history and struggle of getting an education is is something that helped in like like in Australia also experience. So in this novel, we can learn a lot of vocabulary about historical. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is it clear, Raihani? Okay, thank you. Next, um, we have Shifa Kofifa. Hello, my name is Shifa Kofifa. Congratulations to everyone. The topics are really interesting. Here, I would like to ask a question to Dimas. What do you think are the barriers to teach the students English in you? Uh, English using English. Thank you. Okay, Dimas, want to try to answer? All right, so here, uh, permission to try to answer Sipaho Pipa's question. So it means uh, using English song, maybe. So the, the first one is uh, the general barriers in learning English, which is uh, the cultural diversity. So uh, sometimes using song, uh, the students are confused in, uh, in to understand the meaning of the song. And the second one is the appropriateness of the language. So sometimes there's a lot of song that uh, use inappropriate uh, language. So in here, the role of the teacher are needed to guide the student, to guide them to in choosing the correct song to uh, in listening activity. All right, uh, thank you. That's all for me. All right, thank you, Dimas, for your answer. Um, is it clear? All right, thank you, Shifa. Next, uh, we have Nadia Sri. Good morning, my name is Nadia Sri Asisi Anwar. I want to ask Gelsa Santana. There is, it's explained that after finding unfamiliar words and highlighting them, we are advised to memorize them. But I am curious, how do we make it easier for us to remember when the vocabulary list is quite large? Karena mungkin ketika list vocabulary sudah cukup banyak, we will be overwhelmed by remembering it. Sedangkan misalkan vocabulary list di hari sebelumnya pun kadang selalu lupa atau belum teringat sepenuhnya. Thank you. All right, Gelsa. All right, for Nadia's question, I have a suggestion and a strategy that is we can write write down a few words as we can as we can a day in our notebooks. For example, like four hour or five words in a day. And we translate the word and memorize it carefully uh, in terms of its meaning, pronunciation, and how to write it. Likewise, the next day, of course, with the new words. That that way, we will no longer be stranger with the words because we are used to do it. So imagine when we memorize just four words in a day, we can already profession 40 words in 10 days. And when, um, yeah, I think that's enough from me. All right, Nadia, is it clear? Okay, thank you. Next. All right, it's from Shifa Hofifa again. Here, I would like to ask a question to Kantia. I do always talk to myself, then it becomes a habit to the way of me speaking English. Even I did a grammar mistake, I always did it again when I talk to someone. What do you think I can do to solve this problem? Thank you. All right, Kantia, you want to answer? I will try to answer it. Uh, talking about the common problem, it is a common problem for uh, our, especially for learners. Uh, when we talk about uh, 
grammar, as we know that usually when we speak, uh, we make uh, sentences uh, spontaneously and without any uh, planning. So does it that, so it doesn't really matter as long as uh, other people understand uh, what we are talking about. Um, uh, however, like uh, was my topic earlier, I think if we continue to pay attention to our mistakes and practice uh, continuously, it will have an impact. Uh, even to it is not immediate, but gradually. Just imagine when uh, we do self talk, then we are directly in a dialogue. So that uh, this is also related to what Gilsa said earlier that practice makes perfect. Is it acceptable? Thank you. Okay, Shifa, is it clear? All right, thank you. Next, we still have three questions. Ah, this is from Vera Yunita Ariani from University of Singapore Bangsa Karawang. Hello, Vera, nice to meet you. Um, I would like to ask questions for Kantia Aprida Salma. What things should we pay attention to when doing self-talk practice so that this exercise can really make improvement to our English speaking skills? Thank you. All right, thank you for the great uh, question. Uh, I think uh, when we practice this self-talk in front of mirror, we can uh, do a monologue of of what we want to talk or about uh, when preparing for a competition, then uh, what should we pay attention to when doing self-talk? Uh, the things such as pronunciation, how we pronounce uh, each word uh, in our speech, then our expression when speaking, appropriate gesture or body language, even our confidence when speaking. Uh, we can do these things repeatedly and continuously. And in this Uh, all right. Hello, Kantia. I think Kantia have a connection problem. Okay, let's move to the next question. Maybe we uh, we can answer Vera's question after Kantia back. Okay, the next we have from Fauzia Azahra. Good morning, I'm Fauzi Azahra from AED 2020, Oxford University. I'd like to ask Ningsi Yulianti. It was already explained that there are other strategies in self-regulated strategies besides cognitive strategies. My question, my question is, why did you decide to choose cognitive strategies as your presentation topic instead of other strategies in there? Thank you. Okay, Nisi, you can answer the question now. All right, uh, so uh, your question is, uh, why did I choose cognitive strategies as my topic instead of other strategies available in self-regulated strategies? Uh, thank you very much, Fauzia Zahra. That was actually an an interesting question. Um, my answer is that I did choose cognitive strategies as my topic instead of other strategies available in self-regulated strategies, such as metacognitive strategies, management strategies, motivational strategies, because I personally find cognitive strategies uh, is are effective. Like I have experienced applying it by myself in my own real life. So it's easier to talk about something that I'm already familiar with, right? And just like what I have explained before in my presentation that cognitive strategies make students master and understand the material better so the uh, output of the speaking will be good as well in my personal opinion there is no reason to worry about there's no reason to uh, have speaking anxiety if we already master what we're going to say so um, especially if we rehearsed a lot for that 
So when you know exactly like the points that we're going to say in our speech, uh, we'll be much more confident and the speaking anxiety will be reduced, right? So I think it's very interesting to discuss about cognitive strategies. And even now uh, for my presentation, I have rehearsed a lot for this. I have elaborated and organized the material that I'm going to say, and it helps me a lot in reducing my speaking anxiety, but I'm still feeling nervous, of course, because I'm still human after all, but I can definitely say that that this uh, application of cognitive strategies really helped me in reducing uh, my speaking anxiety. So maybe it can answer your question. Thank you. Wow, that's a great answer. Okay, Fauzia, uh, is it clear? Okay, thank you. Uh, next, uh, we have a question from Salma Ayu. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hi, I'm Salma Ayu Belkis from English Education Department, Department 2020. I would like to ask a question for Kantia Aprida Salma because the topic is so interesting. Self-talk is, is good for developing English, especially in speaking. But how to measure or how or know if we have errors in speaking English while doing self-talk? Because no one judge judge us and there is no feedback. Thank you. Okay, Kantia, are you there? All right, uh, thank you. I'm sorry for uh, I'm trouble in my connection. And uh, for this question, thank you for uh, the question. Uh, in this case, uh, we uh, we speak alone and in front of ourselves, but uh, in measuring and honing our uh, level of fluency, we can judge uh, how fluent we are by looking at uh, in front of mirror. For example, when we fluency, uh, when see our fluency and pronounce uh, each word, then speaking style, intonation, and others. So in this case, just do your best uh, by constantly practicing and correcting yourself. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kantia. Uh, how else about the answer, Salma? Is it clear? All right, thank you. So we still have uh, 15 minutes, ah, 14 minutes to the question and answer session. Is still anybody here who wants to ask the question? You can type it uh, in the chat box. Or maybe you want to ask the presenters directly, you can turn on your microphone. And uh, I want to remind you to fill the presence form in the chat box. You can find it in the chat box. Please don't forget. All right, is there any question? Uh, all right, I have an information that uh, our webinar today have two session and this is the first session. So please stay, stay tuned and don't go anywhere because we still have our second session of this webinar. Uh, all right, if we have no question anymore. Finally, we come to the last session of this webinar series. Let me give you the conclusion of today's webinar. Learning English doesn't always have to rely on textbooks and formal explanations. Our speakers have shown that uh, we can explore current trends uh, to be used as material for learning English. Uh, some even mention new things like association strategy and cognitive strategy. Some use everyday, uh, some even use everyday things like uh, music, novels, and even Twitter. Therefore, uh, you can start now because even the small things we do can be a medium for our learning English. As final words, I would 
uh, like to thank all the presenters who who have given a very great explanations. You're all very awesome. And thank you also to all of the webinar participants, wherever you are from. And thank you for your attention and participation today. I hope this webinar can provide new insights that are inspiring and useful for all of you. Once again, thank you. See you next time and have a good day. Ah, all right. Uh, maybe we want to take a picture before we left this room. Okay, to all presenters and participants, please turn on your camera. We're going to take a picture together. All right, um, let's start from the first slide. One, two. Okay, next slide, second slide. One, two, three. Okay, last slide. One, two, three. All right, thank you so much for your participation. See you next time.